In this video, we're going to look at graphing the other four trig functions, so the tangent, the cotangent, the secant, and the cosecant. And then we'll also uh, talk about graphing transformations of these functions. So we're going to start off with the secant of x. So uh, remember the secant is 1 divided by the cosine. And so you can see we have a variable in the denominator of our fraction. Now anytime we have a variable in the denominator, we should be asking ourselves, are there times when this cosine of x could be 0? Because we know that if we take 1 over 0, then that is undefined, right? So anything that makes the denominator of a fraction 0 should not be allowed into the domain of our function. All right, and then one other thing I want us to think about is that um, suppose that I'm not exactly at 0, but I'm close to it. So I'm taking 1 divided by a really small number. Okay, and let's use an example here. Um, suppose that I'm taking 1 divided by 0 0.0001. Well, 1 divided by 0 0.0001, we can easily compute, is a really big number. It's 10,000. So, in other words, 1 divided by really small is really big. Okay, So if we put these two things together, this actually tells us the behavior of the secant function when the cosine is getting close to 0. And we can see that that happens at a few places here. 3 pi over 2, pi over 2, negative pi over 2, and negative 3 pi over 2. So when the cosine function is 0, we know that the secant function is undefined. And as I am close to 0, let's say I'm close to 0 on the positive side here, um, 1 divided by a positive really small number we know becomes a really big number. And if I'm on the negative side, 1 divided by a negative number that's really close to 0 is going to give me an extremely negative number. So what that means is that basically the closer I get to zero from either side, the closer the secant function should be getting to infinity or negative infinity. And so with that idea, what we know is we need to put vertical asymptotes anywhere that the cosine equals zero. So we'll go ahead and put those in. Okay. Now one other observation here is that when you take 1 divided by 1, uh, things are easy. That just equals 1. So is there any place where the cosine of x is equal to 1? Well, sure. Right? That happens here. So I can just put the same point I had on cosine of x uh, for secant of x. Um, and I can see, I guess it happens over here at negative 2 pi, and it happens over here at positive 2 pi. But then I suppose it's also pretty easy when you take 1 divided by negative 1. That's just negative 1. So that means when cosine is negative 1, like at negative pi, I'm down here. And at pi, I'm down here. So I've got these solid points that I know are on the secant. Okay. But, again, going back to this principle of 1 divided by a really small number is really big, we know that, let's start over here on the right, this is 1 divided by these positive small numbers. And we know that that gets really big. Okay, So what happens here is that the secant function shoots up toward infinity as the cosine gets closer and closer to zero. I'm never allowed to actually uh, get to the cosine equaling zero, right? So hence this vertical asymptote, but I do approach it. All right, down here. So as I approach 3 pi over 2 from the other side, okay, it's 1 divided by a number close to zero, but that number is negative. So that would become a really, really negative number. So as I approach, 3 pi over 2, 
I dive down toward negative infinity. And then over here on this other side, the cosine's getting really close to zero, so, uh, but from the negative side, so it's the same thing. So I'm diving down to negative infinity. And so we can play this game in all these little sections till we get a nice picture of what the secant graph must look like. All right, now uh, the thing I want us to note here is that um, the secant graph can never be between negative 1 and 1. And the reason for that is because the cosine is always between negative 1 and 1. And so uh, when you take 1 divided by numbers that are less than 1, you're always going to get numbers that are bigger than 1. Okay, that's just kind of a extending this principle of 1 divided by really small is really big. All right, so uh, then down here, uh, we can make some important notes about the function, right? Func for functions, it's always important to talk about, uh, the, uh, talk about the domain of the function. So what you can see is that the first place to the right of zero that uh, we have to kick out of the domain is pi over two. Okay, and for those of you who don't have really seen this, this is called set notation. So this, the way you read this is you say all x, and then this vertical bar here means such that all x such that x does not equal pi over 2 plus k pi, where k is any integer. So what this is saying is, okay, start at pi over 2 and kick that out. Add pi to that, kick that out. If I add another pi to that at 5 pi over 2, I should kick pi out there as well. But also k can be negative, so if you take pi over 2 minus pi, that puts you here, kick that out. Negative, and then minus another pi, that puts you here, so you kick that out. So this is telling us all the x values I am not allowed to put into the secant function. And then my range, of course, is negative infinity to negative 1 and 1 to infinity. Again, we're not allowed to be anything between negative 1 and 1, although we are allowed to be negative 1 and 1. All right, so let's take a look at the cosecant. We'll go through this one a little bit faster because really the derivation uh, is just like the secant function. It's just that now we're talking about 1 over the sine. So now I'm going to be interested in when is the sine 0? Okay, so that happens at 2 pi. Vertical asymptote there. It happens at pi. Another vertical asymptote. It happens at zero, okay, but usually if, if our vertical asymptote co coincides with the, uh, with the y-axis, we tend not to draw it in, but we know it's there. Um, and then we have another one here at negative pi and at negative 2 pi. Okay, and then let's think about where are the places that the sine is equal to 1 and negative 1, because 1 divided by 1 and 1 divided by negative 1 still give us the same thing. So here at pi over 2, I should be at 1. At 3 pi over 2, I'm at negative 1. At negative pi over 2, I'm at negative 1. And at pi over th negative 3 pi over 2, I'm at 1. And as you'd expect, we really have the same behavior here. So once I've determined those values, now I know what's happening, knowing there's a vertical asymptote right here that I should be approaching. And so this tells us what our cosecant graph looks like. And so we note that we are not allowed to be any multiple of pi. Right? So I say that the domain is x such that x does not equal k pi, um, so any, any integer multiple of pi. And then the range is the same as the secant. It's from negative infinity to negative 1 and 1 to infinity. And I forgot to mention in the previous slide when I was talking about the secant function, uh, the period of both the secant and the cosecant is 2 pi. Which shouldn't surprise us because the period of sine and cosine are both 2 pi. So if we're talking about 1 over the cosine and 1 over the sine, we'd expect that those functions would repeat themselves um, 
over the same period that sine and cosine do. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the tangent function. All right, so we know that the tangent function is the sine over the cosine. So the shape of this function um, is going to be different than the secant and the cosecant. However, notice that because the cosine is in the denominator, the domain for tangent should be the same as the domain for the secant, right? Uh, so I can just repeat it down here. X such that X does not equal pi over 2 plus k pi. So in other words, I just immediately go ahead and go to pi over 2 and put a vertical asymptote and then every pi added or subtracted from that is also going to get a vertical asymptote. All right, and as you can see up above here, the red is cosine, and so every place that the cosine is zero, that's where I put a vertical asymptote. All right, so now let's let's look at this here. Um, I'm taking the sine over the cosine, so let's uh, look at x equals zero. So for x equals zero, we get the sine being zero, the cosine being one, right? Which is of course zero. So that means I'm going to go right here. Okay. At x equals pi, same thing, right? The sine is zero, the cosine is one, uh, excuse me, negative one, but that's still zero, so I put a point there. And x equals negative pi, zero over negative one once again is still zero. So under, understand all I'm trying to do here really is get a feel for some of these easier points. So everywhere where the sine is zero but the cosine is anything really besides zero, uh, I can comfortably put zero as a value for the tangent. All right, now let's look here. Between zero and pi over two, both the sine and the cosine are positive, right? And so uh, I know that over here I should be positive for sure. And as the cosine approaches pi over two, uh, we're again getting that business of a number close to one, right, because the sine is close to one here, divided by a number close to zero, but one divided by a number close to zero is big. So just like with the secant and cosecant functions, I should be approaching that asymptote. But then over between negative pi over two and zero, the cosine's positive, the sine is negative, so it should be a positive divided by a negative, and I should have that kind of action going on. And as you go through and do the same analysis, pi over 2 to pi, I have a positive and a negative, and then pi to 3 pi over 2, I have two negatives, which would make a positive. So again, I should have something like this. And in fact, what we find here is that the tangent function Sorry, that was that was kind of a poor job there. The tangent function repeats itself more often than the secant or the cosecant. You can see that the tangent function repeats itself every pi, so it has a period of pi, not a period of two pi. And then similarly with the cotangent, we can kind of play the same game, but here of course, asymptotes anywhere the sine is zero, so that puts us with asymptotes at pi, at 2 pi, at negative pi, and at negative 2 pi. And we can pick out all the places where the cosine is 0. Okay, so the cosine is going to be 0 at pi over 2, 
at 3 pi over 2, at negative pi over 2, and at negative 3 pi over 2. And we can do the same thing we did basically with the tangent function. So between 0 and pi over 2, both are positive. So that means I'm up in this region. And then here, pi over 2 to pi, one's positive, one's negative. So I'm going to get negative numbers when I divide them. So the cotangent also has a period of pi, just like tangent. But this is what it looks like. And notice that its domain is the same as cosecant. So you're just not allowed to be values, multiples of pi. And then the range is all real numbers, as was the tangents range. But I don't think I pointed that out specifically in the last slide. Here I'd like to do an example where we take a transformation of the secant function. So you can see we've got a couple different transformations here. Um, first of all, the pi. Uh, remember, this has to do with the period of our function, right? So this is the, the b value. And so remember, the period is going to be 2 pi divided by our b value. So in this case, that would be pi. So my period is only 2. And, and so because of this, uh, notice that I didn't put any labels on these tick marks um, because we kind of want to wait till after we determine what the period is to... Um, to make our markings. And, and here, uh, I think we definitely want to just have these tick marks uh, be equivalent to either a half or one. And since the period is two, it's probably sufficient if maybe I make this two, so then this could be one, and so then each tick mark represents a half. So here's negative two over here. Um, and then, of course, we have our negative and our 3 here, right? So the negative indicates that we have a vertical flip of the secant function. And then the 3, of course, means we have um, a vertical stretch, vertical stretch by a factor of 3. So three different transformations uh, that we have going on here. OK, so we know that normally um, for a secant function, the typical kind of starting point that your eye is first drawn to is that when x equals 0, y is equal to 1, right? Because the secant is 1 over the cosine, and the cosine of 0 is 1. So normally, we're right here, OK? Um, but of course, that, that negative, the vertical flip, puts me down here at negative 1 instead. And then the fact that I have a vertical stretch of 3 means I'm actually multiplying by 3 to make my y value negative 3. So here's my first, uh, first point down here at negative 3. And because the period is 2, I know that 2 units later, I should be right back where I started. So I should also be at negative 3 there. Um, I also know that halfway through the period, I should be up at the opposite of negative 3, which would be positive 3 when I go halfway through. And then halfway between this, low, uh, this point here and this, and this point here is when I have my vertical asymptote. And I'm, so I'm basing all of this just off of my knowledge of what the graph y equals the secant of x looks like and what it does. And I can see similarly over here, uh, since the period is 2, back at negative 2, I should be back down here at negative 3. Halfway between those points, I should be up at positive 3. And then halfway between those, those points is when we're going to have our vertical asymptotes. Okay. Now let's talk about one other way we might identify where these vertical asymptotes go. Um, remember, uh, well, let's say that you're kind of struggling to, in your mind's eye, 
picture exactly what y equals the secant of x looks like. But what you do remember is that for y equals the secant of x, you do remember that the domain of this function is that x is not allowed to be pi over 2 plus k pi. Right? So you remember that fact. Okay? So what you could definitely do in this case is you could say, all right, well, if, that, if, if I know that, then y is equal to the secant of pi x. Well, I know that whatever's on the inside, whatever's in the argument for secant can't be equal to pi over 2 plus k pi because I know that's the domain of secant. So x or pi times x is not equal to pi over 2 plus k pi. Okay, uh, but then what I could do at that point is say, all right, well let's just solve for x here. So if I if I solve for x, that would be me taking 1 over pi uh, times both sides of that equation. Get my blue color back here. So 1 over pi times the left, pi times x, and that does not equal pi over 2 plus k pi. And of course over here my pi's cancel, uh, but then on the right side here as I distribute this through, the pi's cancel in the first term leaving me with a half. And then the pi's cancel here, leaving me with k. So what does that mean? <clears throat> that means I know that for the argument that I see here, pi times x, I am not allowed to let x be 1 half or 1 half plus any integer. So 1 half plus 1 gives me 1 and a half. 1 half minus 1 gives me negative a half. 1 half minus 2 gives me negative one and a half. And so that would be another way of deriving where these vertical asymptotes ought to go. Um, I think for a lot of people this is, you know, maybe a little more algebraic trouble than they would like to uh, really, really do. So I, I would tend to say that probably your best bet is to just know that behavior of secant really well, right? Know these these values, these special values here, and know that halfway between them is when you're going to get those vertical asymptotes. All right, but from there we've 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 got the rest of this. You know, we we just we know the behavior of secant. We're going to be approaching our vertical asymptotes um, as as the x values get close to them. Or I didn't really say that quite right. Uh, we're going to be approaching either infinity or negative infinity as we approach our vertical asymptotes in terms of our x values. All right, so we've got this sort of behavior here. All right, so let's take a look at um, uh, the tangent of 1 third x minus pi over 6. So the first thing we should take a note of is that remember that the tangents period is not 2 pi. It is pi. So therefore, um, if we have something like y equals the tangent of kx, and you know, I probably shouldn't have used k because we're kind of tending to use that as our um, as our midline. Uh, shift for sines and cosines. So maybe here, let's go ahead and just put b in here. That was a mistake on my part. Well, there we go. Now fixing that. If you have y equals the tangent of b times x, then the period is pi over b instead of 2 pi over b. But that's just coming from the fact that for both tangent and cotangent, the period is just pi. So I can see right away here that the period should be pi divided by one-third. But of course that's pi times the reciprocal of one-third, so 3 over 1. So I actually get a period of 3 pi. Alright, uh, now I remember that if the argument here is not factored, then this minus pi over 6 is not my true shift. Right? It is not my true shift. So 
I have to factor out this argument. So I'm going to take the tangent, one third x minus pi over 6, and understand that that would be equivalent to saying the tangent of 1 third and let's see what what happens when I factor 1 third out. Of course I get x here but then I know that I need 1 third times whatever's here to give me pi over 6. Well that would be pi over 2. So that means that pi over 2 is our shift And because it's a minus sign in here, it's a shift to the right. Okay, so those are our only two transformations. We've got the we've got the shift, and we've got the uh, change of period. Um, and, and then just also remember that for tangent, um, we know that at x equals zero, the tangent is equal to zero, right? Because the sine of zero divided by the cosine of zero would give you zero. So zero, zero is kind of our typical starting point. Okay. So what's going to happen here is that I am going to shift pi over two to the right. So that starting point has to shift pi over two. So uh, in order to know where that goes, I probably need to think ahead a little bit here. So three pi is my period. Um, so it seems like it probably would be wise if each of these tick marks was a multiple of pi. So let's label this last one here as 4 pi and this one back here as negative 4 pi. So that means my multiples of pi over 2 are all of these little blue tick marks. So when I shift it to the right pi over 2, here's my starting point. So because 3 pi is my period, I know in 1, 2, 3 pi, I should be back where I started. And when I go back, 1, 2, 3 pi should also be back where I started. And I should know that halfway between these points, I'm going to get asymptotes. Use a different color here. So halfway between these two points is going to put me right here. So I have a vertical asymptote at 2 pi. And I have a vertical asymptote at negative pi. And for that matter, I'll have another vertical asymptote back here at negative 4 pi. Okay, and I can't really see it, but there would be one out way out here at 5 pi. So I'll go ahead and I think it's, I can go ahead and sketch that. All right. But then knowing the behavior of the tangent function, I from here just go ahead and understand that uh, to the right of these points, um, or from th to the right of my starting point, uh, the sine and cosine are both positive. So, oops. so the tangent is positive. And to the left here, uh, I know that the sine is negative, but the cosine is still positive. So dividing them will give me a negative number. And then I just repeat. And the more that you just memorize what these basic functions look like, y equals the secant of x, y equals the cosecant of x, the tangent, the cotangent, if you know what those base functions look like, it just makes these, um, it just makes these uh, transformations of these functions so much easier. So really take the time to do that.